Welcome to the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I'm dedicated to helping you take control of your life. Together, we'll explore practical tips, expert advice, and inspiring stories to help you overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Making small changes is possible and can lead to big results. Are you ready? Let's go do this. Hey, Mandy, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to be yeah. here. Thanks for having so me, welcome, Sue. welcome. You know, I we're just going to jump right in. And, you know, I love to let my guests just introduce themselves. And we will pick up from wherever you want to bounce from. And we'll go from there. Sure. Hi, guys. I'm Mandy McAllister. I am a multifamily investor. I was actually a medical device rep turned multifamily investor, bought my way out of my W-2, and then had enough space in my days that this group I joined called GoBundance, they asked me to serve as CEO of the women's division after I bought my way out of my W-2. So I, I now have this opportunity to be shoulder to shoulder with a bunch of incredible female entrepreneurs, uh, Sue being one of those incredible women that I get to be shoulder to shoulder with, just one foot in front of the other, trying to get better every day, just working to lift each other up and live really fulfilled lives of financial freedom, of connected relationships. Oh yeah, I love GoBundance. I'm so thankful thankful that I found them a year ago. I went from having absolutely no idea what I was going to do in life to actually propelling myself in a very interesting but fun and amazing direction. So I'm very thankful. I'm thankful for what you do. It was fun hanging out with you in Nashville a couple of months ago, getting a chance to know you. You're an incredible lady. And so yeah. in light of the theme, small steps, big wins, how about you just Talk about some small steps that you made in your own personal life that you took that you didn't think were going to have big wins, but wound up having big wins for you. I think everything is small steps. I One thing that's always really served me is reverse engineering. Whatever problem I'm trying to address, there is always a way to reverse engineer it. So if you think of the, I love the analogy of Google Maps. So if you want to go, I live in Chicago. If I want to go from Chicago to LA or Chicago to New York City, then I'm, I can do either. I can't do both at the same time, right? So I pick one North Star. I pick one big thing to run after. That's the New York or LA. And then I, I punch it into my GPS. And then it doesn't say, think about Poughkeepsie. It tells me, go 500 feet, turn left. It's all about whatever small step is right in front of me so that I can then get to that North Star. So really kind of dialing back and thinking about, especially as women, I think we we want to try to do everything all at once, like the diffuse awareness of my, I call it ADD, <laughs> but whatever you call it, the, the trying to accomplish a lot of things all at the same time. You can do everything. You just can't yeah. do everything all at once. So these small steps of, you know, did I... Did I accomplish, did I, did I think strategically in whatever thing I wanted to do? So one thing specifically that I do today, I have a whiteboard right over there that I write down the three big things that I need to accomplish today, because I am someone uh, that can just dig into mm -hmm. her checklist and just like poof, look up and five hours are gone because I've now, you know, made doctor's appointments and ordered groceries when I should have made the strategic call mm -hmm. to move business forward. You know, so spending a few minutes at the beginning of the day thinking about the most impactful two or three things and putting those in a place where I, I can't leave without seeing them and without seeing them through, it has been a really incredibly impactful small step. Do you step find for my life. that you actually get more than those two or three things done a day? Like, or, or are they like the top three? And if you get them done, you're like, woohoo, I'm done. I can just go relax. Cause I know myself, uh, I'm like, I have like 10 things a day that's on my to-do list. Mm -hmm. And usually I get them all done. And some days I only get eight of them done. So, and I've heard mm -hmm. the two to three rules. So I, I was just curious on your thought, your thoughts on that. Well, I think mo every day is different, right? Some days I have the bandwidth, some days I have the focus, some days I have the ability to really bang through things on my list that will really move business mm -hmm. and my life forward. And some days you just, you end up not having that time. You know, things come up, the kids' school calls, whatever's going on. But I know that if I accomplish the three most impactful mm -hmm. things, and three is arbitrary, it could mm -hmm. be the one most impactful That's a good thing, point. You know, but I always try to kind of rate 
and rank the things that I have going on. If I pay attention to the things that will get the most done, it's that Gary Keller book. What's the one thing that by doing it, everything else becomes easier or unnecessary. If you just accomplish that one thing every single day, then you're going to be so much further than if you chose something that was more arbitrary. Why did you choose multifamily? Honestly, partially it was a mistake. I, I knew real estate was something that was interesting. I was at a party in college and a friend was explaining her dad bought the house we were standing on the porch of and she rented out the rooms to our friends. And I'm like, and you get to keep that money. That's the best idea I've ever heard in my whole life. So the seed was planted when I was 19. And then I listened to all the podcasts. I, I read all of the books. I did all of the things to be the smartest one in the room associated with real estate investing, not realizing that if you're just taking in podcasts like this, if you're just going to events and listening and learning so that you can be the most informed person, you're not actually putting it into action. If you're not actually doing and taking those calculated risks. This is entertainment if you're not doing something with it. Right. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Right. So I ended up not moving forward in anything with express purpose of investment in terms of real estate acquisition until I was 35. And it just happened. Talk about that first one. When you took that leap, how did you feel about that? Mm -hmm. I mean, did, was that like, I can't believe I'm doing this? What was going on in your mind at that point? I was sure I was going to be homeless and penniless and under a bridge and I was going to never eat again. And I was pregnant mm. with my son at the time. And it just like I was scared to death. But th at the end of the day, I knew what I was taking was a measured risk, right? Like looking back on it, it was a fourplex in a college town less than a mile from campus. For And I, I felt like kids were going to always go to college. And I, I, I knew that I would have some level of demand. I also knew because I had talked with property managers in the area that unfurnished rentals went for $400. One bedroom apartments went for $400. But if you furnish them, then you could get $800 a month. So I'm like, I can buy a couch for doubling the rent, right? So I bought the couches, I bought the, the beds, those things that were required, marketed it with a group that had already plugged in and marketed to college students and poof. I, by the end of the first year, I was cash flowing a thousand dollars a month on this tiny little fourplex. So not only did I not die from the acquisition of this real estate, I was cash flowing a thousand dollars a month. So I thought, Ooh, let's add a zero <laughs> to this. Uh, that, that was nice. I got bit by the bug and realized poof, one transaction was mm -hmm. four units. So that is kind of how I fell into multifamily just because I was looking for something in a college town. That's what presented itself. But then I saw the the benefits. So I, I kind of just, just kept doubled That down. was your one thing then, multifamily. It, that has been my one thing. And I'll, I'll tell you, I think that I, I become more and more persuaded the more I, I see how the rich get richer. You know, like I, I'm a, a farm kid from a town of 800 people who, you know, I'm not silver spoon by any means. I'm a, a bale of hay, <laughs> if anything. But the, the type of debt that you can secure on a multifamily property, it's, you know, not only a longer amortization, which means you pay a smaller slice per month, it's usually a lower rate and it's non-recourse. So if, if it hits the fan, then I'm not personally liable for it so long as I didn't commit these bad boy crime type things. So the way the rich get richer is they insulate their big investments into mm -hmm. different silos. It's like a, a belt and suspenders type thing. So I continue to buy properties that Maslow's hierarchy of needs tells me that people yeah. always need a place to live. So buying a place that people can live on debt that is preferred and insulated from risk is mm -hmm. kind of the best yeah. case Well, that makes sense. I mean, it's kind of the same as don't put all your eggs in one basket, you know, and diversifying what you do as well. Even though it's, uh, I don't know, man. I Andrew Carnegie says you put all of your eggs in one basket and then you watch that basket. <laughs> I don't know. So, I come from the securities think, industry. And so we just, we kind of, you know, diversification is the key, you know. Diversification right, is how you true. don't lose money. Specialization is yeah, how you make is true. a crap Yeah, this is true. Right? So- I feel like, so my first job out of grad school, my master's is in economics. My first job out of grad school, I was a trader. I was on the floor of the board of trade and then I traded stocks upstairs, as they say, in a, for a prop firm. And the, the people who like diversification as they teach it, that's how not to lose money. 
right? So if you want to actually grow wealth to tremendous, you never become a multi-millionaire by diversifying. You you don't lose the thousands of dollars right, you have. Right. You just have to figure out a way to outrun inflation. That's a whole other problem. Yeah. So that's what multifamily is too. That's what buying any rental real estate is because it's a hedge against inflation because the rates you're able to charge, what market rent is, is hedged or tied to whatever inflation is, right? So your rents will continue to go up. And if your your rates of a mortgage payment is locked in, then you're going to be able to, you know, make that delta increasingly grow over time. I have a two-part question for mm -hmm. you about growing your real estate portfolio. Yeah. portfolio. What was one thing you thought would be easy and turned out it wasn't? And what was one yeah. thing that you thought would be hard, but wound up being pretty easy for you? Well, I thought finding deals would be a whole lot easier than it has been. But I will say I'm pretty picky. I'm I'm very, you know, I need to see three, four, five exit plans that make sense to me before getting into something. And that's, I, candidly, I think that's part of the reason that I've been successful and not, you know, been caught with my my shorts down like some of my big multifamily buds have been as of late because I, I had pre-baked in plans for pivots because I like that's just what I needed to see to be able to sleep at night. A thing that was harder than I thought, though that was the thing that was going to be harder than I thought, but the thing that's been easier is you know, the financing. I, I mean, once you have proven, there, there's rules to this agency debt that you have to have the experience and the net worth and the liquidity able to buy these properties. But once you have it, then it's, it's not a rubber stamp, but again, another lesson in how the rich get richer. The more you're trying to borrow, the easier it gets. And I didn't believe it until I started experiencing it. And it's, it's honestly, it's just like anything in life that I've, I've learned. So it's by going bigger that things get easier. It's if you haven't read the 10 X is easier than two X. It's that principle that if you're just willing to open up your brain and go a little bit bigger, Things do yeah, that was a great book. 10X is, is bigger than 2X. So I wanted to ask you about getting bigger and getting out of your own way. What did you have to go through or what process did you go through personally? Talk a little bit about your process. Just because you have built your muscle on multifamily in fourplexes does not mean you have that muscle for a 50 unit or a hundred unit or whatever that is. It's just like, mm -hmm. it's, it's lifting weights, right? So if you get really good at a 10, then that's going to feel easy. And then you try a 20 and that becomes harder and you have to, you know, clear the way for uh, developing that new muscle. So end of the day, <clears throat> the, the things that when going from a fourplex to a 53 unit, that was kind of the biggest leap I took. You know, I, again, thought I was going to be homeless and penniless and living under a bridge, but I realized that when I was making that big jump, I was reading a lot of stoic philosophy at the time. And this idea of what is the actual mm -hmm. worst case scenario kept hitting me. So if I, yes, if you sign up to buy a 53 unit apartment building, somebody's toilet is going to break and somebody is going to mess up the gate and somebody is going to be late on rent. You are signing up for better problems. Those mm -hmm. are good problems to have, you know, people owing you that much rent that you have an opportunity to collect. That is a good problem, but you signed up for those problems. Understand that, right? When I, I dial back and I think with that stoic philosophy idea of what is the actual worst case scenario, it's that, you know, people all lose their jobs all at the same time. Cause this was right at the beginning of COVID when everybody was scared and nobody knew what was going on. What happens if people lose their jobs and we then can't collect rent and can't pay the mortgage? That is the actual worst case scenario. So at that time, we realized that the people that were losing their jobs were like service industry people, like manicurists, bartenders, people who worked in, you know, customer facing things. But people who kept their jobs were IT people, you know, sales reps largely kept their jobs, but they could work from afar. Police officers there are lots of people. Uh, you could tell if those jobs were at risk or if they were required service people. So anyway, what I did is I, I realized, wait, I can figure out the jobs of the people who live in this building. And I went to their applications. I went to the property management firm and said, hey, can I have the applications? And I was able to say, all right, at risk job, not at risk job. 
at risk job, right? And so at, at, at the end of that, I knew from looking at the, the numbers that I had an economic wow. break even point. So up to 43% of people could not be paying me rent and I would still be able to pay to keep the, the property afloat. So 43% of them could not be paying and I would still be able to pay the loan. Well, of the at-risk jobs, 10% wow. of them were at risk. So that felt like a, a risk that I was willing to take, you know? So how can you put more truth to the problem so that you can realize if it is actually a problem or if it's just something that's headspace messing with you? You know, often our minds just default to the very worst case scenario that probably never will happen. And so for you, it turned out okay. And I think putting truth to your situation, no matter what it is. It was absolutely putting truth to the problem. But here was here was kind of how that epiphany hit me. I was uh, coming up through multifamily and many people who do start buying larger apartment complexes, they syndicate. And what that means is they basically bring in a bunch of outside capital and they sell shares of like 70% of that deal. But the, the person who's active and puts that deal together, the way they get paid is from an acquisition fee. So like they get a fee in the beginning, they get a fee in the end with disposition, disposition fee, they say. But the way I wanted to invest was I wanted to invest like how I saw billionaires investing. I want to buy and own this for the long term. I don't want to be a flipper like in single family where I turn something around and sell it quickly. I want to buy and hold. So I asked a friend who came up in multifamily at the same time who was a syndicator, well, what do you need to see? He was also medical device adjacent, high earner. What do you need to see to be willing to leave your W-2? And he's like, oh, well, all I need to do is like this deal and then that deal. And then I get this acquisition fee and that disposition fee. And I'm like, he goes, I have to do four deals a year. And I'm like, oh my God. What if you don't find four deals that are worth doing? Like, are you going to do crappier and crappier deals because you were dependent on these fees? And then I realized, poof, no, what I need is a floor of income. And that putting truth to that problem, that is a math problem, Sue. I can go, I can go do the math to figure out what I'm going to need in order to feel financially free. So at that same time, I was reading the Tony Robbins book, Money Master the Game, and that's largely about stock trading and investing, but the concept of varying different levels of financial freedom hit me really hard. Like you don't need $30,000 coming in a year in a jet to, to feel financially free. Like you might be able to just pay your mortgage and you'll, you'll feel a significant level of power. So if you go to my website, anybody who's listening, mannymcallister.com, it's a freebie. You'll punch in your email address. We'll quickly email you the that calculator that helped me figure out exactly what I needed to see to be willing to leave my W-2. And then after I hit that number, this is actually a little funny, the universe helping me out. And that's like the, the universe helps you out too. So I was, I got a chance to talk on a, a boot camp, and there were 900 attendees. One of those attendees happened to be a colleague in a different division of the medical device company I worked for. And I had just hit the cash flow number that I needed to see to be willing to leave my W2. And I said it to the 900 people. I'm like, don't sell me out, Jim. Don't tell anybody. And then a bunch of weird stuff happened. So I don't think I've ever told you this, but, but then like my boss moves to Texas and then all these weird things happen. And then literally three weeks later, after I said that out loud, that guy, Jim is now my boss. And Jim comes to me and he's like, was that for real? Cause if that's real, then I need to start recruiting. And so the, the universe you know, put my feet to the fire because I could have easily kicked that can down the road. I didn't want to. Uh, but it was it was better that um, the universe helped me. It's amazing what happens, whether you believe in God, universe, spirit, whatever, when you have that faith out there and you have that positive energy and you just believe it is all going to work out, it really does all work out. You know, and mm -hmm. we were just talking before, if you're going from one place to another and Google only gives me the roads that I need to be on that are right in front of me. And that's the same thing that yeah. happens in life as well. And we forget, we forget that it's like oh i want to be a multimillionaire tomorrow and like no it doesn't work that way you have to go through the steps in order yeah. to get there from point a to point b and that's where yeah. that's where that faith comes in and that's where that trust comes mm -hmm. in but sometimes the path takes a veer in a direction you didn't think and it's a really cool one <laughs> you know? well and the, the, like the montage from when Rocky figures out what he needs to do. And then there's this montage of him in training and fighting and then the final fight, right? That montage makes us feel yeah. like in our American brains, like that that 
30 seconds. Well, that doesn't take 30 seconds, that montage. That montage takes five years yeah. to create. And it's just faith and next right step and figure out and like be curious and show up that it, it's it's when you're mm -hmm. in the messy middle, it's really difficult to remember why you're yeah. doing what you're doing. So I, I applaud people like you for making sure that that messy middle and next right step stays in the forefront. And the other thing is that you just have that sense of building something and you also have to know your why. You know, like, why am I doing this? Why am I leaving mm -hmm. my job? Well, I have a bigger vision for my life. I know I'm heading in this direction. And then you pick that one thing and then you start running after that. What was your big why back then when you were contemplating leaving your W-2, you're jumping to multifamily? What was propelling you? What was your big why? So I, I knew I always wanted to be the mom who got to mm -hmm. volunteer at my kid's school. And I knew that that wasn't going to get to be the case if I was on call for these medical device procedures, right? So that was always there. However, like that was a that was a gain that I would have gotten, but I think people are propelled more by fear and bad emotions than they are like the the puppy dogs and rainbows, you know? So I had a, an old boss who basically if anybody's ever been in sales, that when you kill it one year, they usually then increase your quota such that it's really difficult to meet it the next year. So I was in, I finished, I think, number six out of 500 reps one year in a medical device job. And then the next year I was struggling to hit my quota because it had been increased so much. And my boss was telling me to just go find more patients, just go find more patients. You get like, no, like I'm not going to look at patient information. That is not something that feels okay or within my moral compass. So I choose not to follow <laughs> that direction. And I, I basically realized that I, I could operate within that moral compass because I had a little bit of cash flow coming in. I was a brand new single mom at the, that time. I had just gotten divorced and had full custody of my son. And I was nervous. Yeah. I was scared that if I don't do this thing that my boss is telling me to do, then I'm going to lose my job. Well, oh my gosh, if I just double down on this investing thing, then I'm going to be able to write my own script in a way that I won't if I let my, my livelihood be in the hands of this man who's telling me to approach this in a way that doesn't feel right. So I, I think I ran away from that more than I ran towards being room mom. But the result is I'm, I'm in the same place. I get to be the room mom for Halloween yeah, cool. next week. You know? <laughs> That's exciting. Yeah, I think the big why really mm -hmm. is propelling. And your why, like you said, your why can be a good why, but usually there's, when there's a painful why, that's the motivator. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when you're in that pain point to to move forward or it's that situation with people or you just have this entrepreneurial bug deep down that you just, you know, just has to be fulfilled. If you could go back in time to your younger self and tell your younger self a message, what would it be? Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I think many high performing women get wrapped up in being perfect. There's an incredible TED talk and then subsequent book called Girls Are Taught to Be Perfect, Boys Are Taught to Be Brave. And I completely believe that, right? So even from chores that girls are given, like you stay here, honey, and I'll fold the laundry with you. I'll help you do the dishes. You stay here and you watch under my guidance and I'll, I'll teach you how to be perfect. And boys, go out and mow the lawn. Go figure it out. Go be brave, you know? So in terms of entrepreneurship, being perfect gets you nowhere. Being brave is where all the juice is, right? So I, I would have wanted... 15 year old Mandy to be able or to be willing to, to take a chance, to be willing to fail forward because failure isn't death. <laughs> uh, if you're not perfect, you don't die. You get a chance to learn from it and then, you know, do better the next time. So you don't have to be perfect is what I tell her. So I think we can sometimes go back to that perfection mode. I struggle with it too. I mean, I was in the same boat, you know, like mm -hmm. if, it, if I couldn't figure out how I could get an outcome that was perfect, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. So well, what did you do? Yeah. I'm a recovering perfectionist, I call myself. Uh, it's, but I think it's a muscle, just like anything, that you know, once you have realized that you're going to be okay, if you fail and you learn from it, that is the ultimate win. If you lean into vulnerability, if you lean into 
figuring your own stuff out, that is the ultimate win. I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I love to run at stuff I don't think I can do now. I love to run at, okay, if I want this for my life, then that is the thing I'm going to have to fix. So for instance, my 30th birthday present for myself was I, I physically trembled when I would be front of room. Like you, like when I defended my master's thesis, like I was shaking in such a way that it was not, it would not support the life that I have now. So I, for my 30th birthday present to myself, I bought myself improv comedy lessons at Second City in Chicago. So I took a year of classes and our first performance, like, you know, I was on stage in front of hundreds of people and I didn't die, you know, and I said things that were stupid and I messed up and I made errors all over the place, but you, you know, just rolling with the punches, it was, was such a great lesson. Baptism by fire really got me there. The more you do something that you were afraid to do in the first place, the easier it gets anyway. hundred percent. That's, That's the, muscle. the muscle. I mean, that $120,000 fourplex that I was going to be homeless and penniless because of, you know, literally eight years ago, you know, like that, that would be a no brainer. Anybody listening should really be encouraged in that we overestimate what we can do in a year. We underestimate what we can do in five. Yes. A hundred percent. So talk about fear a little bit. How do you mitigate that? Because, you know, being a perfectionist, there is fear involved. Being a recovering perfectionist, mm -hmm. you had to, as a perfectionist, face fear because, you know, perfectionists don't like to be wrong and we're afraid to get it wrong. We want to get it right. How did, how did you do it? Perfectionists are so scared to screw anything up, but they don't make moves. Like the analysis paralysis like avatar is someone who is a perfectionist because you're never going to be perfect in everything that you do. One of the books that was kind of all the rage through Go Bud and Swim and not that long ago was called The Psychology of Money. And my primary takeaway from that was you just need to be reasonable enough. You don't need to be perfect. You don't need to like there's no way you will ever know the ultimate top of a market, the ultimate bottom of a market, just being reasonable enough. But end of the day you know, fighting fear, running up against something that scares you is it, it's a muscle too. But realizing that no matter who you are, if you are, you know, Sarah Blakely launching a new product, a homegirl's scared when she's doing stuff, but she's doing it anyway, right? So if, if the path to mastery, if the path to an incredible life that's fulfilling is running at fear and doing the thing anyway, then that is the lesson I want to take home. And that is the lesson I want to teach mm -hmm. my kids. Perfect. You know? Yeah. Just run after it. Run into the storm and you're not going to die. Well, have you heard the, oh, the Buffalo? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Buffalo yeah, yeah, yeah. I've totally storm. heard the. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to torture this. But when a storm is coming in, cattle on the prairie, they, they get scared and they run towards, they run away from it. Well, what that means is they end up in the storm for longer. Well, buffaloes, they start running at it. What that means is they, they get to it faster, yes, but they're through it much faster. So if you, if you are scared, if you are cattle, then you end up staying in the fearful thing for longer. If you can be a buffalo, you get out of the thing. The only way out through, of fear right, is through. Right. Uh, 100%. 100%. Well, this has been so good. I I enjoy talking to you very much. I'm going to wrap up soon because I know you have to go as well. But I do want to touch on Go Abundance Women. It's impacted me. I, I can't, I'm not able to join yet. But the the couple interactions that I have had with ladies, just a tremendous impact on me in a short amount of time. What are some new and exciting things coming up for Go Abundance Women? Yeah. So sure. thank you for that, Sue. I, we are a group of, of female entrepreneurs who are all accredited investors. So what that means is you have a net worth of a million dollars or you make $200,000 a year or more. The, the arbitrary line in the sand is because the types of money problems that you discuss are a little bit different if you're accredited or not accredited. So if and when you hit this, those criteria, then we could be able to talk with you about joining the group. However, we do allow for potential members to join us for one 
event as a guest. Sue joined us for our event at a summit in Nashville. That was, it was just tremendous. It was a chance for connection. It was a chance for learning how to play bigger. It was a chance for like masterminding ideas and problems of figuring out that next right step. Because, you know, my problems, when you're in the fire, you can't see what's around you, right? So you being in your fire, you couldn't see the things that were right in front of you. And I remember you talking about the guidance that you got for what was your next right step. So our next big event will be in Costa Rica. We are we are actually working on some business buying speakers because one of the things that's all the rage right now is if I'm buying a multifamily at a four cap, I'm basically saying I'll pay $25 for a dollar of cash flow. But you can buy a small business for buying a car wash actually next week. So I'm paying $2.50 for a dollar of cash flow instead of $25. That's a 10x difference of return. So I'm very excited to, to play that out. So if you are interested in learning more about Go Abundance Women, it's GoBundanceWomen.com, G-O-B-U-N-D-A-N-C-E. W-O-M-E-N.com. We do a monthly call that is value packed. So if you have not been on it, I would love to get your two cents. We talk a little abundance mindset. I talk about some investing hacks that I've figured out along the way. And another one of my partners talks about making more time for yourself. So amazing group of women. When I was in Nashville, it was 48 hours of just sheer camaraderie, authenticity, friendship, mm -hmm encouragement. I mean, just all in one. And I have just been so blessed to find this group, like Go Abundance as a whole, Emerge, and then Go Abundance Women. And I look forward to qualifying next year. As we close up, I have my three core questions I love to ask. The first one is share a book or podcast that's had a significant impact on you. So I think I've named a couple of books uh, as we've gone. But you know, the, the one thing, if I could only name one that I think is going to give people in the messy middle which is really, I, I think your core audience is people looking to level up and, and ramp up the, the one thing, what's the one thing that I can do by, by doing it, everything else becomes easier or unnecessary. So the one thing by Gary Keller was really impactful for me. What is, and this one might be a little bit longer for you to answer and that's fine. What's one question or topic you wish I would have asked about and how would you have answered that question or unpacked the topic? Huh. I, I think you did a great job. I the one thing that I, I think I, I didn't speak about, probably because my ADD brain took a squirrel left hand turn, was this idea of when leaving a W2, it can feel so permanent. And actually maybe I'm gonna speak right to you, Sue, because you're right in this right now. It can feel so permanent and it feels scary because it's this, oh no, I'm retired now and I can never go back and get another job yeah. and I'm gonna die homeless. Yeah, 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 I'm in that right now. That that feeling. Yeah, I, I see you. So the, the way, the mindset little hack, the shift, the ninja trick that I chose to take on was by considering it a 12 month experiment that I'm just going to line in the sand today. I'm going to look back at how I'm doing 12 months from today. And I have enough confidence in my ability to sell and the relationships that I have grown in medical device sales. I can make three phone calls and find a job in a month. I have that. I have a high level of certainty that that's something I'm going to be able to do. So I'm going to just live this out, squeeze the juice out of this 12 months, see how I'm feeling about where I'm at at the end of those 12 months. And if I don't like it, then I go find a job. It takes all Perfect. The I'm so glad you said that because that is in the back of my mind as well. It, you know, it's funny how we live life in just the moments in front of us. And we think that that's how life is always going to be. And we have to remind ourselves that mm -hmm. life is fluid. It is not something mm -hmm. that stagnates. I mean, you know, you could stagnate where you live maybe, and that could be a choice. Somebody could stay there for 30 years, but even look at the couple, take a couple that's living in the same house for 30 years. And then you ask them mm -hmm. what has happened in this house in 30 years? Oh, well, we moved in when we got married. Oh, we had one kid. Oh, we had three mm -hmm. kids. Oh, we had some, we had this tragedy happen. Oh, these kids left and got married. And then all the dynamic change that happens over the course of that time, we forget. Thank you for mm -hmm. reminding me that nothing is really that permanent, you know, and when you commit to something, go ahead and commit to it. Like I committed to my podcast for 52 weeks and still going. You know, I didn't awesome. give up every week. There's something produced 52 weeks and it's taken me in a place where I didn't think. So I'm glad you mentioned that. And when you run that worst case scenario, it's really not that worst case scenario. As we close, what's one small step that someone can do today that's going to help them 
change there tomorrow? Well, if you are interested in leaving your W-2, knowing a target to hit, it was life-changing for me. So put any problem that's in front of you, put more truth to it, and it will be easier to solve. If it's that W-2 thing, do your numbers. I have a free thing on my website. Go grab it. You know, so figure out the problem you're trying to fix and then figure out how to put more truth to that problem. Works. Works. Mandy, how can people reach out to you? I think you mentioned it. My handles on Instagram and Facebook are official Mandy McAllister or my website is mandymcallister.com. Thank you so much for the gift of your time. This has been awesome. I look forward to having you back again and yeah. you will chat soon. Awesome. Thank you, Sue. What a pleasure. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Small Steps Big Wins podcast. I value your time with me and I seek to make every moment count. In order to make lasting change in your life, listening is usually not enough. So I want to ask you, what practical steps are you going to put into action today as a result of listening to this podcast? Remember, any step, any action, no matter how small, starts your journey to a big win. And if you're not sure where to get started, check out my website, personalcoachfinder.com and find someone who can help. Remember, life doesn't get better by chance. It gets better by choice. Take small steps today and make your life awesome, friends.